to ask the first question. Okay, over here. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Knauf from Automobilwoche. Mr. Gohn, there were uh, rumors that uh, Nissan intends to raise its stake in Renault from 15 to more than 25 percent. Is that true? Well, first, as you said, it's a rumor. Uh, we, we never comment on rumors. Uh, I know that the media love uh, dramas and uh, things and passion. Uh, so they fabricated something absolutely extraordinary. I mean, what I want to tell you is we are, and when I say we, we're talking about the management, the boards, the executives, the corporate officers, members of the executive committee, all the shareholders, we are all united by one very important element is the fact that the alliance between Renault and Nissan has been a tremendous uh, asset for Renault and for Nissan for 16 years. Okay, this is something that nobody can dispute. Which means that the priority for both companies is to continue to strengthen this alliance so each company can benefit from it. Okay, that's it. And, and frankly, this is the goal that we all share. I mean, you didn't hear anybody, any stakeholder telling you the contrary. Everybody telling you, no, 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 alliance is good, we need more of it, we need to strengthen it. No matter what, everybody agrees on this. Now, so as long as we agree on this, which is in fact the essential, well, I have absolutely no concern that whatever issue, whatever problem will be overcome because we are all moved by the same uh, goal, okay? Uh, for the last 16 years, I don't want anybody to think that the Alliance has been a easy, uh, no problem, uh, no tension. It was not. There have been, from time to time, discrepancies, difference of opinion, tensions. There were plenty of them, okay? But we overcome each one of them, and we delivered a lot of results. So, which means that What's happening today is not, nothing exceptional compared to what we have had in the past, and we're going to continue with the same spirit of building the lines, constructing the lines, strengthening the lines, and making sure that this is a partnership. This is absolutely not a relationship of power between the two companies. You know, this is a partnership. We're together, and we'll be working and continue to work together no matter what. Okay? That, that's the only comment I would make. Next question over here. Mr. Cohn, you are operating an industry where there's a lot of transformation going on. Some of it accidental when they get discovered cheating. Some of it because manufacturers think that they have to make major changes. Uh, VW, Fiat Chrysler, other manufacturers are talking about uh, new alliances, new partnerships, some People may see their companies broken up because of mistakes. Can you comment in general on what sort of trends you see, uh, whether you want to talk about specific manufacturers or just in general what you see happening over the next year or two because of all these changes? Well, you know, I think, uh, I think change is going to continue, obviously, because the, the, the reasons for change are accelerating. And there are two main reasons for accelerated change. And if I want to take change, I'm talking about consolidation. But obviously, when you talk consolidation, most people think mergers and acquisition. It's not. Consolidation can take many different forms. It can take the form of alliance, of corporations, of uh, whatever the corporations are broad, whether they are specific to a product, to a technology, to a country, and cooperation between companies which are competing against each other. Okay? That's what I call consolidation. Consolidation, by the way, doesn't touch only the car maker, it does the supplier. It, uh, it can touch uh, the distributors, it can touch the tech companies uh, working for the, uh, for, the, for the car makers. That's what we're talking about, consolidation. But there are two factors coming which are given, going to accelerate the consolidation. The first one is, as you obviously have noted, the, 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 the car market is slowing down. You know, we used to grow at uh, after the collapse of Lohman Brothers, etc., and the unfortunate 2008-2009, uh, uh, we were growing at 4-5% rate a year. Well, in 2015, compared to 2014, we're practically stable. 
Well, next year, if we're lucky, we'll get 1.5% growth uh, uh, overall. If we got lucky, a maximum 2%, most likely we're going to be somewhere between 0 and 2. Okay? And unfortunately, we don't see anything much better after, which means that we're getting into a period of time where growth is going to be particularly limited. First pressure, because you know very well that growth helps a lot car manufacturer, even the smaller one, to continue to develop their business. When the markets start to become more stable, it's more difficult. That's number one. Second, you've seen in this motor show and many other motor show, the amount of technology coming. You know, we're talking about connectivity of the car, we're talking about autonomous cars, we're talking about zero emission, low emission, we're going to take much more restriction. Well, all of this means much more technology, much more constraint, which means that you cannot bypass any technology anymore. You cannot shortcut anything. You're going to have to develop all of this, which obviously means also a lot of resources. Well, if you don't have the resources, you're going to need to take this technology from somebody or buy it from somebody. And nobody's going to sell you the technology unless there is some kind of contract, some kind of link. Okay? Third factor, adding to this, you have newcomers. They are not coming to the industry, but they are very interested by the industry. They are the software maker and the tech company saying, well, if the car is going to be more connected, it's going to be more autonomous, I can play a role. And how big a role, nobody knows for the moment. They probably don't know it themselves because it's going to depend on the opportunities. And the opportunities are going to depend on how fast we move into this. If we are slow, well, they're going to say, well, they are slow, let's, let's move fast. If we are fast, they're going to play a different role. So all of this, newcomers, more technologies, more uh, devices, more emissions, restriction, all of this is going to make it obvious that the industry are going to need to consolidate more one way or, or the other. Now, the, the, you, you know very well that our experience, I'm talking about our industry, our experience in consolidation is not such a bright picture because a lot of the mergers collapsed, a lot of the uh, uh, you know, uh, tentatives which have been done did not deliver results. Uh, there are very few cases where you can say this is a clear, productive, uh, partnership, which means there, there are more hiccups coming for the car industry for the next two to three years. That's for sure. Next question over here. Nikkei. Nikkei Shimbun, my name is Nakayama. Thank you for the opportunity. The United Kingdom is maybe withdrawing from the EU. Regarding the subject, Mr. Gon, what's your perception? This is the first part of my question. If UK get out of EU, how does it impact the management on Renault and Nissan? Oh, I, I don't think there's going to be big impact. We've been very clear on this. Because, you know, this story of the UK in or out, uh, the euro, the, uh, it has been a very long story. That means from time to time you have uh, acceleration, from time to time it slides down, then it comes back. Um, f bon, as you know, Renault has no presence in the UK, no industrial presence in the UK, so it doesn't make any big difference for them. Uh, for Nissan, uh, it's a big difference because Nissan is the largest producer, assembler of car in the UK today with, with the plant of Sunderland. On top of this, the technical center of Nissan for Europe is based in the UK, etc. Which means what? It means that uh, Nissan investments in the UK are European investments based in the UK. Because Sunderland produce 80% of the cars which are exported to Europe. Okay? 80% of the cars based, 70%, 80% of the cars in Sunderland export to Europe. So we have European plants, we have European technical center based in the UK. So now after this, it's, everything is easy. I mean, if uh, the UK remain hooked uh, to, the, to Europe, there's no problem. If the UK is going to st start to separate from Europe, then obviously we're going to have to adjust in function of that. But it doesn't make any sense to prepare plans before because nobody knows what's going to happen. But when it happens, we will change. Nobody change existing things. What you change is future things. Okay, so I don't think if this happened, all of a sudden you're going to have changes in our plan. No. But when you have new investments coming, you're going to be weighing what's the best place to position the investment, taking into consideration the reality of the, of the situation. But for the moment, I'm not particularly 
worried, you know, and I don't think it's going to have an immediate impact. But the reality is our investments in the UK are European investment based in the UK. Okay, next question over here from India. Good afternoon, Mr. Gon. I am Sumantra Barwa. I represent a magazine called Autocar Professional in India. My question to you is the picture that you see, the future that you see for the automotive industry. In such a challenging future, what is the role for markets like India you see? And uh, as far as the ongoing midterm plan, Power 88, uh, do you see in the, what, what is the role of India specifically you see for both Renault and Nissan in the upcoming next midterm plan? And uh, one specific, the quid has really caught the fancy of the customer. But uh, is this also uh, enhancing the competition between the two brands uh, to a level that maybe there may be a discomfort in terms of the competition uh, between the brands? Uh, your thoughts on these, please. So I don't know how many questions you have here. You know, uh, please help me. Uh, guide me, just make sure I didn't miss any one of them. Uh, India. Uh, India is the market with the highest growth. Uh, in 2015. I think we're going to end up with 7 or 8 percent growth. Uh, um, that means from the large market in the world, highest growth in India. Uh, we think it's going to continue. We think India is on a situation where we can envision India we're going to be at the top level of growth of the large market for the next two to three years. Okay? So it means that for all car makers, India is becoming more and more important because there is growth and as you know, this is a market where you have, uh, which is very rare uh, between the large market, you have one or two car manufacturer having 70% of market share. Uh, this is something you don't see in many countries in the world. Certainly, certainly not in uh, you know, big markets or developing markets, you, you don't see it. So everybody thinks that there, there is an opportunity here. Uh, at least for the small guys to, to do a better job. And we are part of the small guys, obviously looking for doing a better job, contributing more to the Indian market. Now, India at the same time is a complicated market, as you know. It's a complicated market. It's a market which needs real understanding. And it needs, and you need to understand it not by reading books about the Indian market, but just practicing the Indian market. And it's trial and error, and trial and error, and learning and correcting. And that, that's the way you learn your way to the Indian market. Um, we've tried many things in India, you know, very well. We abandoned what didn't work. We are concentrating on what works. Quid is the result of this trial and error, where we ended up having a technical center in India. We based a platform in India. We, we started it in India. We do it with the Indian suppliers. And at the end of the day, we come with an attractive car, which is a very competitive price, which, by the way, is not going to be an Indian car. It's going to be a global car. This is a global platform. But if we test it in India and we are successful in India, we know we're going to be successful in Africa. We're going to be successful in South America. We're going to be successful in the Middle East. Because India is probably one of the toughest markets for these kind of cars. If you do it here, you're going to do it in many other markets. So uh, my point, I don't think there is any competition between our brands. Um, um, there have never been. I mean, we've been working for 16 years with the two companies. I mean, the largest market where the both, both brands are present is Europe. I mean. Uh, there are absolutely no, nobody's going to say that one or the other is growing on detriment. There is no, and frankly, even into the shopping list of the consumers, it's very rare that Renault and Nissan are on the same shopping list. You know, when, on the shopping list of Renault, you can see Volkswagen, Peugeot, uh, Fiat, Opel, Ford, etc. And on the shopping list of Nissan, you can see Toyota, Hyundai, uh, Honda, Mazda, Mitsubishi, and others. So it's a completely separate kind of, uh, uh, of shopping. List. So there is not so much you know, problem to position the brand. One is clearly a French uh, company uh, with the European uh, flavor. The other one is a Japanese company with an Asian flavor. And uh, consumers absolutely have no uh, confusion between, uh, between both. We make cars on the same platforms, but they are different. That means you can look at. Uh, X-Trail uh, from one side and Kajar for, for Renault from the other side. Frankly, there are uh, no way a consumer is going to say, oh, they are look alike. They are not. Because the designers are not the same. The product planners are not the same. They have a different culture, different. Uh, so 
I'm not absolutely worried about that. Now, uh, uh, from time to time, what may happen is one move faster than the other. In this case, Renault establishing quid is going to move much faster. Well, they're going to be a Nissan car on the A platform, the same platform coming next year, but it's going to be different. A different design, different concept for different people. So again, common approach, common performance, different shapes, different appeals. So I, I'm not so worried about that. Next question. And yeah, I don't think, no, frankly, I think for Power 88 and Renault Drive the Change, which are the two midterm plan of the plan, India is not a big stake for both companies. But they're going to be a big stake for the next plan. For the next plan, they're going to be a big, big stake because obviously the two companies are going to be growing in India. And as you know, with India, Indian market growing by 7 or 8% a year, that's going to be a big stake for the next plan. So one thing you haven't mentioned. This is question number 15, huh? <laughs> Okay. Okay, next question over here, this gentleman in the middle. Uh, I'm from China. Starting from 2013, Dongfeng Nissan was established. It has been 12 years. It has grown quickly and has experienced a lot of success. But Renault's development in China is not very uh, good. So after the establishment of Dongfeng and Renault, many Chinese people think that there has been a lot of difficulty difficulties. Maybe in 2016, there will be the first uh, uh, automobiles in China. What's your uh, opinion about this Dongfeng and Renault's uh, cooperation? What about the Dongfeng and Nissan's cooperation? Everybody. Uh, Nissan, before having uh, their, their own plants in China, used to sell 30, 40,000 cars. This was in 2001, 2002, OK? 30, 40,000 cars. After establishing the plant and the technical center and localizing the production, this year, Nissan will be selling 1,250,000 cars. At that moment, a lot of people told me, you're coming to China too late. OK, why? Toyota was there, Honda was there, all the car makers were there. And say, well, you know, guys, you, you're coming in 2002. What are you going to do? OK, how are you going to appeal? We end up being the number one Japanese maker today in China with 1,250,000 cars. What's the base? Localization, good partner, good product, good understanding of the market, a lot of work, and this is the result. So arriving late or early doesn't going to make a difference. Because you can arrive early and do nothing. You can arrive late and race at the top. When you lo look at China uh, market, it's interesting. Some people arrived early, made a big hit. Some people arrived early, never did anything. Look at the arrival of car makers in China, the timing, what brand arrived when, and look at the photo today. There is absolutely no correlation between when did you arrive and what's the position you have in the hit parade of the Chinese market. So I think judging Renault performance based on present sales, which are based on one product, which is imp two products, which are both imported, one from Spain and the other one from Korea, is not fair. Because obviously you can't compete in China if you're not localized. I think you're going to see the real potential of Renault when Renault will start producing in China. And I think Renault growth in China will be very fast for a very simple reason, is Renault is backing by all the experience of Nissan. The plant in Wuhan copy-paste on the Nissan plan. The platforms used for Renault, Alliance platform. Most of the uh, suppliers, local suppliers, are also suppliers of Nissan and Renault, so the scale is much bigger. Uh, the exchange of executives, the exchange of experience in marketing, I mean, Renault's gonna move very fast. So please do not judge the potential of Renault based on the present performance of Renault, which is based on importing some cars from Korea. Uh, this is just for a warm up to help the dealer network get ready. I think you should have a clear opinion on Renault probably two or three years down the road when one, two, three cars of Renault localized will be launched. And this is where you'll see the potential, particularly that we're starting with the crossovers, 
which is, as you know, one of the most dynamic segment of the Chinese market. Thank you. Okay, next question over here, this lady. Asahi Shinbun, my name is Tanaka. Thank you. In the morning, I was at the press briefing. You said that the new autonomous driving concept car was there. And on the other hand, sports car or the dynamic performance, driving pleasure equipped vehicles are also displayed. At this time, driving pleasure on the one side and autonomous driving without putting your hands on the steering wheel in the fundamentals of the cars, you are at the tipping point or the turning point, it seems like. How do you see this? That's my question. Well, if I understand well your question, what I want to say is that our objective in autonomous drive is not take you out of the car. That's not our objective. Our objective is keep you in the car by empower you. Whenever you want to drive, you drive. Whenever you don't want to drive, you don't drive. That's autonomous drive. That's the difference between with driverless cars. Driverless cars are cars without a driver, which is obviously what Uber and Google are pursuing. It's a completely different objective because this is more a commercial objective. But our main objective on autonomous drive is make your life on board more pleasant, easier, and you decide when you want to drive, when you don't want to drive. So people say, yeah, but you know, I like to drive my car. Good, you'll drive it all the time. If you like to drive in traffic jams, well, you know, you'll have the possibility to, to do it, okay? But if you don't like to drive in traffic jams, then you put it on and the car drives you. If you're tired, you can stop. If you feel like, I mean, we want this ability to empower the driver, you know? Uh, today, you don't have this ability. Today, you're stuck with your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, period. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a problem with the police. Uh, well, we want to be able to drive safely with our technology, with your hands off the wheel, your eyes off the road. And this is one of the big advantages of autonomous drive. We're starting like this. Now, maybe the technology is going to allow us to see more advantages, okay? Because I don't think we've seen all the advantage of this. There may be more advantages that we'll be seeing soon. But already with these advantages, we think it's huge. And we think a lot of consumers will be interested. That's why we're so excited about autonomous drive. And we want to come as soon as possible on mass marketing these technologies. Well, the, and uh, as I said, it doesn't depend only on us. Because nobody can put uh, autonomous driving technology and allow you to benefit from it without the regulator accepting that. Because the government needs to say, yes, I accept that you drive the car without your hands on the wheel, et cetera, et cetera. Well, for the moment, it's not done. So we're going to be a lot of testing. There's going to be a lot of cooperation with them to gain this kind of acceptance. Next question. Can we, let's take a question in the middle, because we haven't gone to the middle yet. My name is Insan from uh, Medi Indonesia Daily. Um, as the number one market for uh, Datsun, could you tell us about the uh, plan of Nissan in Indonesia, especially in terms of the future closest investment. Thank you very much. Uh, we, as you know, in Indonesia today, the most successful brand for us is Datsun. The most uh, successful models are Datsun, which is a clear indication about where is the bulk of the, of the, of the market in Indonesia. Uh, for the moment, we have more than enough capacities in Indonesia, so I don't think we are uh, envisioning any additional investments in Indonesia. We have already invested a lot in terms of capacity. And as you know, the Indonesian market has been slowing down or declining uh, lately. So all of this drives the fact that I don't think we have any plan for more investment in Indonesia for the short term, unless there is a very strong recovery of the market that we don't see. Okay, next question from Russia. Good afternoon. The question about Russian market. Out of us brings only losers to Renault-Nissan Alliance. How long will you tolerate it uh, and uh, when uh, the out of us will, be, will, will go on the mend, will be a profitable company? Thank yeah. you. Well, uh, I, I think it's not a secret to tell you that I don't know any car manufacturer making money in Russia today. Uh, with the market down by 50%, 50% down. 
I don't know who's making money. I know a lot of people are losing money. I don't know anybody who's making money in Russia. So I don't think singling out Aftovaz is fair because Aftovaz is suffering even more because Aftovaz is mainly concentrated in Russia and have very little export. So their main market going down 50%. Obviously, it's a huge suffering. Suffering for the company, suffering for the people. We understand that. But at least what we're trying to do is prepare for the future. We know that Russia is not going to be down forever. You know, the Russian market collapsed very quickly, but it can rebound very quickly. Today, we are at 50% of where the market was three years ago, 50%. This market practically flirted with 3 million cars a year. This year, we are around 1.5 million cars a year. Okay? So it's a, it's a dramatic reduction. That means the only thing comparable was probably the US market after the Lehman Brothers, which went down, not even to 50%, but something around that. It was dramatic. So it's normal that the local big car manufacturers suffer a lot. And I can tell you, without the efforts of the management of Aftovas, the results would have been even more dramatic. I think they're doing whatever they can in order to shore up the operation, limit the losses, but particularly limit the losses by preparing for the future also. Because again, there are going to be light at the end of the tunnel, and we are preparing for when the light comes for us to be competitive again. Okay? So uh, I am, if, if the losses were due to complacency, if the losses were due to lack of competitiveness, if the losses were due to passivity, then tolerance would be zero. But as long as the losses are unfortunately a main factor for all the industry due to the sudden collapse of the volume, and people are doing everything they can in order to limit the losses and prepare for the future, we're just going to have to be patient. Next question right over here. Right here, sorry. Hello, Mr. Gorn. After the diesel gate, uh, clients are looking for more transparency from uh, OEMs. Um, some constructor from France, actually, uh, are willing to publish their real consumption uh, figures. Uh, what are the measures you are uh, intending to apply on the consequences of this yeah. case? But, I mean, can you explain to me what is a fake consumption and the real consumption? There, there is no fake consumption. There is a standard measure, which is not measured by the car makers, but which is decided by the European community. That's what they call a standard measurement. So now that people, when they drive their car, find a completely different number than this measurement, it's normal because nobody's going to drive this car exactly following the standard European. Particularly, you have so many countries with so many different cars. So there are two different things here. You have cheating, which is a different story. Okay? And then you have the discrepancy between the standard, which is not decided by the car manufacturer, but decided by the European community and the real experience. But what is real experience? You drive your car different from me, different from him, different from her. You have a different car, you're in a different country. What's real? Okay, so, so that's where we need to decide what is the thing that's going to represent real drive experience in Europe. With so many different segments, so many different cars, so many different drivers. That's an interesting debate. We obviously hope that we're going to come to a good conclusion, but before going towards a direction, you need to define it. What is real? What is real for you is fiction for him. It's uh, something different for him. So how, how do you do that? So what's going to be common? What's going to be differentiated? Should we differentiate between segment? Should we differentiate between country? I, mean, uh, I, think, I think it is something that we, we shouldn't let people think that all of a sudden they're going to get in information which correspond to their use of the car. It's not going to happen. Because it depends also on the driver, not only on the car manufacturer. So <laughs> I'm a little bit cautious here that we don't transparency, total transparency. But transparency should be honest, should be, this is something we can do, this is something we cannot do. Because if I promise you something and then you find that it's not true, you're going to be even more frustrated about what's happening. Today, what you need to know is that the car makers do not measure the emission the way they want. There are rules and there are tolerances. Maybe the tolerances are too big. 
but this is up to the European community to decide. It's not up to us. Like in the United States, you don't decide how you're going to measure your emissions. You follow the rules of the country. In China, it's exactly the same thing. We try to influence these rules as much as possible, but at the end of the day, it's a standard established by government, and we just need to you know, follow what the government say. Okay? So now, if every car manufacturer say, I have my real driving uh, experience uh, measurement, you're going to be lost. Because then when you're going to have to choose between three car manufacturers, if each one have his own real driving experience, you're going to be lost. Because if you don't have the same base on which they measure, how are you going to see if one is better than the other, more efficient? You don't. At least when you have a standard, even if it's artificial for you, at least you have one set of measurement with a tolerance that everybody follows. Okay? So uh, that's, that's what I can tell you about that. I think transparency, I totally agree with you. We all want to be transparent because we want to gain the trust. Trust is fundamental to our business. So everything we can do in order to gain the trust, we will do. Okay, we'll take one question here and then another one over there. Okay, it's the lady in the front. Um, I had a question about the possible effects of the diesel scandal um, from a different perspective, um, especially related to powertrain. Um, because the Tokyo show is showcasing quite a bit of interesting future powertrain technologies, including your um, your venue. And I was wondering what your vision or what your view is on the potential lasting impact of this diesel scandal in the industry when it comes to these types of technologies. Um, you know, the thinking on powertrain, um, could it in any way accelerate the acceptance of electrified powertrains, EVs, et cetera? Yeah. Well, first, uh, let, let, I mean, obviously, I don't think Anybody can, with certainty, guess what's going to happen. But there are certain things that we can common sense bet that this scandal is not going to make diesel more popular in the United States. Okay? This scandal is not going to make diesel more popular or more easy in Japan. So the country which don't have diesel, I mean, if you come and you say, I have a competitive advantage, I have a clean diesel, for the moment, I think it's not going to be a winning campaign. Okay? So that's one, that's one side. The second side in Europe, well, in Europe, it's going to depend a lot on uh, you know, the new standard. I think there is a discussion about real driving uh, emission, uh, and, and the Commission is going to make a decision about it. So we're waiting to see what's going to happen. We're obviously giving our opinion as a, as a, as a car association, as car manufacturer association. We'll see. It would be fair to say that, <coughs> at best, diesel will be stable, at best, in Europe. Which means that we have to be ready for the decline of diesel, no matter what, for the decline of diesel in Europe. That, that, that's what I would tell you. Which means on, on profit of what? Obviously, gasoline certainly, electric car, plug-in hybrids, hybrids, maybe fuel cell one day, no doubt about it. But there is such a backlash on diesel today which, by the way, didn't start with the unfortunate uh, event of one of our competitors. It started before. We have already some backlash preparing on diesel before. So with this, it's accelerating. So I would say, again, it's very difficult for us to put numbers about how much is going to decline, in what country, on what category. It's very difficult. But I would say that today is about the maximum that we can expect for diesel in Europe. Okay, great. One question here in the front. Uh, Mr. Gun, Patrick Walter, German newspaper, Frankfurter Allgemeine. I'm wondering uh, about the automated, automated driving. You, as far as I understand, you say you want to bring that to the market in 2020. Do you really city driving? With city driving. Do you really expect that the government uh, in Japan will have the rules ready and that the society is ready at that time to sell these cars? I think, I think if there is a government which would be ready to launch it, I think probably Japan. Because we have had very easy discussion, particularly with cities and regions in Japan, to test. We are testing today autonomous driving cars, public roads in Japan. Which, as you know, in Europe is practically impossible to do. That mean, our German colleagues are complaining that they can't find a place in Germany where they can test their car. Uh, Holland is making a proposal to do that. So th we're still looking for a place to, to test these cars. Okay? So my point is, um, 
The technology will be mass marketed when governments want it. Our job is to make sure the technology is ready. So I'm telling you, we'll be ready by 2020. We, a car manufacturer with a reliable technology, with all the devices, 2020, city driving. Highway before, traffic jam before, but city driving, 2020. Now, will it be mass marketed in 2020? Well, it depends on uh, who's going to decide what. But when you see the advantages of autonomous driving, particularly on safety, because one of the reasons of autonomous driving is safety, which is obviously a big concern and preoccupation and incentive for governments to accelerate, accelerate it. But there will be some investments in infrastructure also, because autonomous driving is going to necessitate some infrastructure changes and investment in order to guarantee that the system is reliable. So, what I'm telling you is 2020 will be ready. Will this be mass marketed in 2020? This will probably more depend on a public-private public cooperation. Okay, next question over here, this lady over here. You wanted to ask a question? Okay. Good afternoon, Mr. Gorn. I'm Luciana. I'm from Global TV website. I'd like to hear you about the uh, Brazilian market. We are living in a very difficult situation this year. We will probably lose the title of fourth uh, biggest market in the world. And also, not only economically, but living political turbulence. So I'd like to hear your commentary. Well, uh, <laughs> that means we talked about Russia. Um, Brazil, unfortunately, is not too far uh, because, as you know, this year, to the surprise of everybody, we are towards minus 25% in Brazil for the car market. After a year where we have been at minus 10 or 15%, so the Brazilian market fell by 40% in a couple of years, which is huge. Now, so, unfortunately, we're not seeing a better situation in 2016. We don't. So... We see, at best, zero, if not another decline. That's what we're seeing for Brazil. And unfortunately, until this political situation clears, I don't think there's going to be any recovery of the market. So uh, you know the complexity of the situation. Uh, you know everything which is being decided. I don't need to make for you a drawing, which means until there is a clear hope that people are all working together to get out of the trap in which Brazil is, I think you're going to see this market staying where it is today or a little bit down, which means 40% below where it was. While fundamentally, frankly, I think it's, it's, it's a very heavy penalty for Brazil in, 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 the, in, the, auto market, uh, in the auto market. That's unfortunately what I see. Now, uh, if, if, we take, that mean, if we take the main emerging markets, Russia, I think in Russia we have about 300 cars per 1,000 residents. In Brazil, we are about 200. 20, China is around 100, and India is about 25, okay? So uh, what I'm saying is there is no reason for Brazil not to be at least at the level of Russia. So I still think that there is a potential for growth for Brazil, which is tremendous, as you know. The problem is when it's going to be unleashed, when we're going to stop the internal discussion about all these problems and really focus on the growth of the economy because the demand is here. Okay. So unfortunately, not so much good news uh, for us. It's unfortunate because we all invested a lot in Brazil. And for the moment, we are using partially the capacity. Now, the collapse of the real is making export attractive again, which is the, the positive side of the, of the news. Um, but the Brazilian market, for the moment, we're going to need to be patient with the Brazilian It will come back, no doubt about it. When? Different story. Unfortunately, we don't see it in the short term. Okay, two more questions before we finish. Here in the middle, over here. Jelil Bonani from uh, Moroccan Daily Newspaper, Les Inspiration Echo. Uh, as a world um, uh, leader in electric cars, uh, don't you think to uh, add new models to, uh, to the lineup, uh, to the current lineup, uh, Nissan or, or Renault? I'm thinking especially um, to a big performance sedan that could compete with, uh, against uh, the Tesla Model S, for example. Yeah. Well, uh, no, you're not going to see that because, frankly, we are concentrated on the mass market, the core market. We think going in niche is very small volume. Um, 
and uh, there is already somebody doing a good job there, so why going after uh, a segment where you have already somebody when most of the market is into the mid-sedan and the family sedan? And if we want to move somewhere, we'll be moving to crossovers, which are becoming, as you know, much more popular everywhere. In Europe, it's booming. In China, it's booming. And in, uh, I don't think you're going to see us soon in premium with electric cars. Okay? It may happen one day, but I don't think we have today. This is not our priority. Our priority is mainly the, 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 the heart of the market. Okay, and we'll go to the last question over here. Uh, <clears throat> we have been uh, talking about uh, the autonomous driving vehicles uh, in which, you know, uh, you have been uh, speaking about the regulatory uh, concerns that we, that, that we have to um, overcome or win over, you know, the, you know, the regulators. Yeah. Now, what uh, are the biggest uh, technical uh, hurdles that the, that the autonomous vehicle has yeah. yet to uh, overcome? B very clear. Technical hurdle, two. Two technical hurdles. The first one is reliability. Because obviously, if you have more autonomy, you're, you're just trusting the car. You're not going to pay attention. You're not going to correct. So you have to have a very reliable system which means that it's not only that we need to create the function, but we need to test the function and elaborate the function in order to be completely reliable. It's a question of, obviously, liability for the car maker. That's number one. This is far from being done. The second is the cartography. The maps have to be extremely precise and actual. Actual. And you can understand city maps, uh, you're going to need something which is, you can't base on something with two weeks information, it's gonna have to be real-time information. Because if, if you have work on the street and the street is being barred and you don't have it in the cartography, you're gonna have an accident. So, so now, thinking about this in Tokyo or Paris or New York is easy, but now you're gonna imagine it in Mumbai and Rio de Janeiro and, and Sao Paulo and Mexico City. Uh, you, you know, this is, which, which means that the technology that you're gonna have to be put into the car needs to be an online technology. That means you need to have real-time information about the mapping. That's going to be a second challenge. At least with these two one, we have uh, plenty in our hands. Huh? Oh, yeah, many of them. That means mapping is done by HAIR, which is the Nokia uh, uh, affiliate that the, our three colleagues from Germany have uh, decided to acquire. It's done by Google. And it's done also by Mobileye, you know, that Mobileye, which is a startup coming from Israel, collaborating with General Motors to give you, to give real life information. There are many, many, and you have a lot of startups because, you know, obviously startups are feeling that there is a lot of software needed to develop uh, the connected car and the autonomous car. So a lot of them are jumping on the opportunity to develop a piece of technology they consider, they consider uh, acute, yeah? So now, uh, you, you have been uh, speaking about, uh, ha you have been uh, giving a, a target of uh, 2020 for a yeah. rollout of this uh, technology, and what we're talking about, uh, develop, uh, develop a country like Japan. So for other countries, such as mine, as Mexico, what would, you, uh, would your guesstimate it's be? It's going to depend a lot on the cartography. That's going to be a key issue to launch it in a country. Because you can understand that if you have autonomous car and you're going to allow the people driving your car to switch on autonomous, and if uh, cartography is not reliable, you can imagine the consequences of this. OK, that ends okay. our session for today. Thank you so much, thank Carlos Gon. And thank you, everyone, for your questions. See you next time.